Part 1 You will hear a science student inquiring about English courses at a university language centre. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 7. Hi, I've come to ask about the English courses you run for international students. Oh, right. I assume you're a student at the university. Yes, I've just started. Okay, well, we've got a range of courses. It depends what you think you need and how much. Oh. Um, we can't run everything at the same time, though. So, for example, in this first term, we are just doing a writing course. I see. That sounds quite useful. What else is there? Um, some of the courses only run for single terms, and we tend to focus on what students have difficulty with. That means we don't usually do speaking courses, but next term you can do listening. Oh. That'll help you with lectures and things. Our provision is all based on what the majority of our international students need. So, is everything term-based? There's nothing that you run all year? Well, let's have a look. Yes, there is a class for vocabulary and grammar every term. That's for everybody, but it's split into three or four levels. And what about in the holidays? We don't do anything during the winter or spring break. Mm. But over the summer, there's just general classes because that's what most students want. Mm. A bit of everything. Mm -hmm. OK, quite a variety then. Mm. I'll uh, have a think about what I really need because I haven't got much time. Do you have about 20 students in each class, the same as our science seminars? We try to keep it at about 12 and certainly not more than 15. Mm -hmm. It's important for language classes. They're very different from your normal courses. Right. And how much are the classes? The rate varies depending on how many hours you attend, but you shouldn't have to pay. Usually, the department will fund you and even sort out which classes you need. Oh, brilliant! <laughs> it would be quite useful for me to have a certificate to take back to my country. Do you put us in for exams? Yes, but we don't like them to clash with your main course exams in June, so we run them in May. Oh. That leaves you time for revision. Do I have to sign up for something now? I'm not quite sure what I want. Classes haven't quite started yet, so you've got time to decide what you do. All we insist is that you sign up before week five. That gives you about three weeks to decide. OK. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 8 to 10. Then, when you've made up your mind, you need to come back here to the administration office to enroll. What do I need to bring with me when I enroll? My identity card, I guess? Yes, or your passport. Uh -huh. Then you'll be given a registration form, which you'll have to show to the teacher when you have your first class. OK. And um, should I ask my tutor about which classes I should do then? Yes. Then you get a note from him and give that to the desk when you register. Can I use the computers here as well? Yes. You'll be given a password when you go to your first class. So remember to bring a disk with you to save your work on, as you won't be allowed to save it on the hard drive. OK. Will I need anything else? Dictionary? We've got loads of those here that you can borrow. But you'll need a notebook as we don't provide paper or files. OK. Thanks.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk given by Madeline. She is going to introduce the recreational facilities on campus and in town. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Madeline Stewart, and I'm here to tell you about the recreational facilities available on campus, and also to tell you something about what the town has to offer. You may already know that your student's union membership also includes membership of the sports union, which provides a range of sporting and recreational facilities on campus much the same as those in most British universities. The sports union has football, tennis, and cricket teams in local competitions. And really, most sports are catered for in some way on campus, even if they're just social matches. In the building itself, there are fitness classes and a full gym, including weights. The sports union can also provide cheap tickets to some major sporting events. And to keep you up to date with everything available, there's a weekly newsletter distributed around the campus. You should check this to find out the names and phone numbers of the contact people for each sport or activity you are interested in. Er, yes, did you have a question? Yes, uh, apart from what you've just said, does the sports union offer individual help in any of its activities, uh, for example, in getting fit and healthy? Yes, we do. The sports union has a fitness assessment clinic every Friday staffed by the resident sports trainer, who can provide advice on the best program for you and refer you to various charts. I'm sure you all realize that for any medical assessment or health problem, you should go to the university medical service. The sports trainer can also advise you on a suitable training program using the weights. And now on to Ashbury. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. And now on to Ashbury. For a town of its size, Ashbury has some unusually good leisure and sporting facilities, most of which are near the center of town and easily reached by bus from this campus. There's a new, well, almost new, Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's not quite in the central town area, but it's only a five-minute walk from the bus stop. Above the pool, there's a high-tech fitness center that any of you more serious fitness lovers would need to check out. Then, in the center of town, there's a sporting complex called the Anderson Center, which contains squash courts and facilities for a number of other indoor sports, such as basketball. And just around the corner from the Anderson Center, in the main street there, is an indoor bowling alley. All of these facilities are listed in the weekly newsletter, so I encourage you all to look through it and... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. To hear a reporter from the New York Times who is presenting a news report prepared by Dion Cierci and Robert Gabaloff on the topic middle class shrinks. Further, as more fall out instead of climbing up. First, look at questions twenty-one to twenty-three. As you listen, answer the questions. The middle class that President Obama identified in his State of the Union speech last week as the foundation of the American economy has been shrinking for almost half a century. In the late 1960s, more than half of the households in the United States were squarely in the middle earning. In today's dollars. Thirty-five thousand dollars to hundred thousand dollars a year. Few people noticed or cared as the size of that group began to fall, because the shift was primarily caused by more Americans climbing the economic ladder into upper income brackets. But since two thousand, the middle class's share of households has continued to narrow. The main reason being that more people have fallen to the bottom. At the same time, fewer of those in this group fit the traditional image of a married couple with children at home, a gap increasingly filled by the elderly. This social upheaval helps explain why the president focused on reviving the middle class, offering a raft of proposals squarely aimed at concerns like paying for college education, taking parental leave, affording childcare, and buying a home. Before the conversation continues, look at questions twenty-four to thirty. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. Mr. Obama told Congress and the public, "Still, regardless of their income, most Americans are identified as middle class. The term itself is so amorphous that politicians often cite the group in introducing proposals to engender wide appeal." The definition here starts at thirty-five thousand dollars, which is about fifty percent higher than the official poverty level for a family of four, and ends at the six-figure mark. Although many Americans in households making more than hundred thousand dollars consider themselves middle class, particularly those living in expensive regions like the Northeast and Pacific Coast, they have substantially more money than most people. However, the lines are drawn. It is clear that millions are struggling to hang on to accoutrement that most experts consider essential to a middle-class life. I would consider middle class to be people who can live comfortably on what they earn, can pay their bills, can set aside something to save for retirement and for kids in college, and can have vacations and entertainment," said Christine L. Owens, executive director of the National Employment Law Project. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a program on the city of Brisbane. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today in our Around the World programme, Mr White is going to recommend a charming city to you, Brisbane. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Have you ever been to Brisbane? Well, if you are looking for a mild climate, a relaxed atmosphere and a lot of culture, Brisbane might be the place for you. Its sunny cafes and offshore islands attract surfers and sun lovers, but it is also the arts capital of Queensland, with many museums and art galleries. This thriving artistic setting mixes well with Brisbane's beach town atmosphere. Together these two qualities make Brisbane a very desirable place to live. No wonder since 1980 over a half a million Australians have moved here. Brisbane is now Australia's third largest city. English settlers living in Australia established Brisbane in 1842. At that time, more than a 100,000 Aboriginal Australians were living in Queensland. As the settlers discovered Queensland's resources, more and more of them moved in. Regretfully, the settlers drove the Aboriginal Australians from their lands. By 1859, Brisbane had grown into a prosperous city. In 1988, the world watched as Brisbane hosted the World Expo. This international fair showcased new technology, but it also showed off the city of Brisbane to the world. Brisbane also hosts a wide range of events year-round. In April, everyone can enjoy a few laughs at the comedy festival, and movie lovers will enjoy a film festival that takes place every August. For two weeks in September, there is an outdoor festival of the arts. In October, a music festival draws a large crowd. And in January, you can see Brisbane's most bizarre event. You may be surprised to hear that. The annual cockroach races. That's right, people really do train and race cockroaches. Brisbane's nice climate and compact design makes it easy to explore on foot. Follow the golden arrows in the footpath around the city centre. This will lead you on a tour of Brisbane's historical district. From the city centre... Take a boat across the Brisbane River to Southbank. This area is popular for its bike paths, beach and weekend market. Hundreds of artists display their wares at this market. It's a great place to pick up some interesting handicrafts. Well, I think what you must be interested in is the unique native animals. Yes, you shouldn't visit Australia without seeing its trademark animals, the koala and kangaroo. The Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary has both. It is located just outside the city centre in beautiful Parkland. You can hold one of the park's 130 koalas or feed the kangaroos. Another quiet refuge from the city is Mount Kuta, about 8 kilometres from Brisbane. On a clear day, it offers spectacular views of the city. It also has hiking trails and beautiful gardens. Along the Brisbane River, a sunset cruise is also very relaxing. The areas around Brisbane are impressive. A coastal drive south of Brisbane will take you along the Gold Coast. This famous coastline boasts some of Australia's best beaches. Stradbroke Island is another easy day trip from Brisbane. A cliff on the island called Point Lookout offers a great view. From there you can see dolphins swimming below. Brisbane Forest Park, to the north of Brisbane, is a great place for hiking and camping. These great getaways, along with Brisbane's own laid-back charm, make this city an ideal place to visit. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Over the edge, feel like